committee will come to order. Without objection, chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Uh, pursuant to committee rule 5B and House rule 11, the chair may postpone further proceedings on any question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment on which a recorded vote on the yeas and nays are ordered. Uh, before we start, Mr. Cummings, I want to welcome you back, and I want to tell you uh, you were missed on a personal and a professional level um, how wonderful the, the other members uh, were to work with uh, in your absence. Um, your your um, absence is impossible to fill, but they did their best to do so, uh, including uh, the staff. And uh, on behalf of every member on our side, we are thrilled to have you back. Chairman, you for a moment? Yes, sir. I want to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, working with me uh, during uh, almost four months of uh, what was supposed to be a three-day procedure. In other words, I was supposed to be back in three days, and I am coming back in 103 days. Um, but uh, I am well, and I want to thank you for your courtesy. I want to thank uh, you, Ms. Connolly, for all that you have done. And I want to thank the committee and the many members who expressed their prayers and thoughts and concerns. And uh, I am indeed grateful. I can tell you one thing, Mr. Chairman. When you stay in a hospital uh, for over 45 days, you get to see the health care system from inside out. And I will never be the same, ever. Um, and so I thank you again. I thank you for uh, constantly checking on me uh, and trying to make sure that we were working together. And, um, and congratulations, too, because I missed that. Um, you, I think you got appointed right after I went to the hospital. But thank you very much. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, Mr. Connolly. I, I just want to add my words to, to yours, Mr. Chairman, in welcoming a distinguished ranking member back. Um, we missed you. And, uh, your staff did an incredible job. The committee staff on both sides did an incredible job uh, trying to fill the void a little bit um, while we waited for your healthy return. And you also have, I think, uh, the distinguished uh, accomplishment of not an unkind word was said about you for 103 days. So, I mean, congratulations for that. Uh, but uh, uh, we really missed you and we're so glad you're back. Welcome back, Elijah. Our first item for consideration is H.R. 3731, the Secret Service Recruitment and Retention Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3731, to provide overtime pay for employees of the United States Secret Service and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman from the great state of Texas, Mr. Hurd, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is with pleasure that I get to um, talk about Mr. John Katko's bill, because for over 150 years, hardworking individuals of the U.S. Secret Service have been asked to put their lives on the line to protect key government officials, including the President, and to secure events of great national significance. They managed to do all this despite the Secret Service suffering from historic levels of attrition and challenges related to recruiting new talent. In a December 2015 bipartisan report, our committee found that the Secret Service was experiencing a staffing crisis that threatens to jeopardize its critical mission. Due to low staffing levels, Secret Service employees have been forced to work excessive amounts of overtime. No matter the number of hours worked, Secret Service agents are subject to a statutory cap on their biweekly pay. As a result, agents are not paid for overtime hours if doing so would result in compensation above the cap during any pay period. These max outs, as they are known, contribute to the agency's low morale and unsurprisingly cause the rate of attrition to spike. Congress addressed this issue in 2016 by lifting the cap for agents on protective details during the presidential campaign. Unfortunately, the Secret Service continues to struggle with hiring and retention, exposing nearly 1,300 to the risk of exceeding the cap in 2017. This legislation extends a cap waiver for Secret Service employees who work on protective missions until the end of 2018, allowing employees to receive compensation up to the basic pay currently given to members of the executive schedule level two. Every Secret Service employee who has exceeded the cap or who is at risk of doing so because of excessive overtime will receive additional compensation under this bill. 
However, the Secret Service cannot continue to rely on excessive overtime to fix its staffing problem. This bill requires the Secret Service to submit a comprehensive strategy on overhauling the hiring process and improving retention, while also providing information on total costs and disbursement of overtime paid under this bill. While the pay cap waiver is a short-term fix, Congress fully intends to focus and to continue to focus on ensuring the Secret Service implements a long-term, meaningful reform to improve hiring and retention, thereby reducing the need for overtime at the agency. All of this information will be useful as Congress works towards a long-term fix to address problems plaguing the Secret Service. I urge all of my colleagues to support this bill. And I'd like to thank the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko, and of course my friend, the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for proposing this piece of legislation. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Texas yields back. Uh, before I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, you know, even while you were out recuperating and rehabbing, and I would call at the worst possible time in the middle of one of those two, uh, you made it clear that this was important to you even while you were out and you wanted it dealt with upon your return. And with that, um, so thank you for being willing to work on it even while you were recuperating. Uh, gentlemen's recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, I want to thank you for uh, keeping your word. Uh, you have made it clear that we would have a bill to address the Secret Service pay situation when we got when, uh, this, uh, for the first markup, and that is exactly what is happening today. And one of the reasons why I was so concerned about it, Mr. Chairman, is having been an employer. Uh, I have seen so many situations where um, people really depend on their paycheck. I mean, a lot of times people don't realize that if, if, a if somebody doesn't get paid, that means that the babysitter can't be paid, they can't get the groceries, they can't pay the mortgage. Uh, but in this instance, and I, I want to associate myself with every syllable that Mr. Hurd just stated, uh, it goes to something even deeper than that. Uh, in the secret service and other services, imagine uh, you work you're, you're hard and you, you come home, you tell your wife, look, uh, I got to work for Thanksgiving, I got to work on Christmas, and then you say, oh, by the way, I am not going to get paid for the over overtime. Um, that goes to morale. And I, I think it is very difficult to retain uh, any staff if you are not going to pay them. And I know that there has been a lot of controversy as to uh, what happens with regard to the many protectees uh, under our present president. But I have made it clear, I don't care who the president is, the Secret Service has to be paid. And so I am very proud to be joining with my colleague, Representative Katko, in introducing this measure to help Secret Service agents receive the overtime pay that they earned and, in fact, they deserve. Our bill would authorize an increase in the annual salary and overtime limit up to level two of the executive schedule for the men and women of the Secret Service. This would allow them to be compensated for the considerable hours of overtime they have already worked in 2017 and will continue to work from now through 2018. Last year, this committee unanimously passed legislation that authorized overtime pay for the thousands of hours of overtime that Secret Service agents worked in 2016, in the 2016 presidential campaign year. This year, more than 1,000 Secret Service agents have already maxed out their pay limit. And we are just in September. They will not receive any additional overtime pay if Congress does not act. Recently, C Secret Service Director Ailes stated that due to the President's large family and frequent travel, it has no ability to address this issue by itself. It is clear that the demands on the Secret Service will continue to be extremely high for the foreseeable future. Congress has a responsibility to provide the support to the Secret Service that is needed. Our bill would allow the men and women of the Secret Service to be paid fairly for the hours they work. It would also help the agency effectively and efficiently recruit and retain the very best of the best. 
Mr. Chairman, I thank you once again for your support on this bill. Uh, you have been, I mean, just a staunch advocate. And I also thank uh, your staff and for their assistance throughout the process. I want to thank my staff for all the work that they put into this. I also thank Representative Bonnie Coleman Watson, uh, Watson Coleman and Eleanor, Horn, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who are uh, original co-sponsors of this bill, along with Representatives Michael McCall, Benny Thompson, John Radcliffe, Sheila Jackson Lee, and Daniel Donovan. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I have two letters of support for this bill, one from the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association and the other from the Senior Executives Association. I ask unanimous consent that they be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. And again, going back to what Mr. Hurd said, we've got to really, Mr. Chairman, we've got to really look at the Secret Service to make sure um, that, that, that we give them the kind of support they need, but we've got to get down to how do we retain uh, these, these uh, great men and women. And I mean, just logic just tells you if you're not going to get, get paid, you're probably going to go somewhere else. And these, these people uh, can go almost to any agency because they are held in such high esteem. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? General Lay from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to say welcome back to my ranking member, Mr. Cummings. It's so good to have you back. I want to thank Mr. Katko and my ranking member for introducing this important piece of legislation and you, Chairman Gowdy, for your support. The Secret Service plays an incredibly important role in our government by keeping the President and his family, among others, safe. Unfortunately, in recent years, the Secret Service has been plagued by recruitment and retention problems fueled by morale challenges. In particular, since last year's presidential campaign, Many agents have been forced to work extra hours without overtime pay because of the statutory cap on their compensation. While Congress passed a one-time fix late last year, the overtime pay cap has affected over 1,000 agents this year. As ranking member of the House Homeland Security Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security, I have seen the negative impact this cap has had on the ability of the Secret Service to do its vital job. We can't be surprised if agents look to leave the agency or if recruits are reluctant to join when we are asking them to work long hours without pay. For these reasons, I am an original co-sponsor of this bill and urge my colleagues to support it. However, this bill is only a short-term fix. With the current administration, it is clear that Secret Service agents will continue to be overworked and underpaid after this bill's provision expires. Therefore, I am particularly pleased with the requirement that the Secret Service report to Congress on their efforts to improve recruitment and retention, which should provide information that will help us address this problem on the long term. And while I had hoped to offer an amendment to improve the bill by requiring the Secret Service to report on efforts to improve the recruitment, hiring, and promotion of diverse candidates in the Secret Service, I understand that this committee does not have jurisdiction over the reporting section of this particular bill. I therefore hope that the members of this committee, and you in particular, Mr. Chairman, will continue to work with me on this issue on the bill as it moves forward. So I thank you again for your support of this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The general lady yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? Questions now on favorably reporting H.R. 3731 to the House of Representatives. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Next item for consideration is H.R. 3739, the Presidential Allowance Modernization Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3739 to amend the Act of August 25, 1958, commonly known as the Former President's Act of 1958, with respect to the monetary allowance payable to a former president and for other purposes. Ask unanimous consent the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss, sponsor of the bill, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
The Congress passed the former President's Act of 1958 to maintain the dignity of the office of President and assist former Presidents who did not have sufficient financial resources. It is a noble purpose, but times have changed. When, former pres when the former President's Act was passed, Herbert Hoover, uh, Hoover and Harry Truman were the only two living former Presidents. Unlike more recent former Presidents, they did not earn millions of dollars from speaking fees and book deals after leaving office. For example, President Clinton earned more than $100 million in speaking fees between 2001 and uh, 2013. President George W. Bush received $10 million for his book deal. President Obama and the former First Lady reportedly signed a joint book deal worth over $65 million. It is a fact of the modern presidency that these lucrative financial opportunities are available to former presidents. Because of these opportunities, it is no longer necessary to provide taxpayer-funded support to former presidents in the same way as envisioned in 1958. This bill presents a fair way to reduce taxpayer support to those former presidents who no longer need such assistance. Furthermore, with our nation facing $20 trillion in debt, we must find ways to save taxpayer money, and our former presidents will lead by example in cutting costs under this bill. This bill will reform pensions and allowances provided to former presidents and surviving spouses and reduce unnecessary costs to the taxpayer. This bill will set a former president's pension at $200,000 compared to the current law where the pension is linked to a cabinet secretary's pay level, which currently is $204,700. Surviving former spouses will be eligible for a pension of $100,000 versus $20,000 pension under current law. Currently, former presidents are also eligible for other benefits paid through annual appropriations. These benefits include office spaces and leases, furniture and supplies, and staff salaries. These additional benefits provided to former presidents totaled $2.43 million in fiscal year 2016, $2.84 million in fiscal year 2017, the requested appropriation for fiscal uh, year 2018 is $3.63 million. Instead, this bill will provide $500,000 allowance to each eligible president to cover such cost. This allowance will be reduced dollar for dollar for any earned income in excess of $400,000. For example, a former president making $900,000 in earned income would not be eligible for the allowance. For former presidents eligible for the allowance, the allowance will decrease over time. Five years after a former president has left office, this allowance will be reduced to $350,000. Then 10 years later, the allowance will be reduced to $250,000. In the 114th Congress, the Presidential Allowance Modernization Act of 2016 was passed, but it was not signed into law. Senator Ernst and I have worked with relevant stakeholders to improve the bill in 2017. The 2017 bill advances the same principles of accountability and modernization as the 2016 legislation, but makes some key changes. First, the bill provides a six-month period after the date of enactment before the bill takes effect to ensure current former presidents have time for the changes. Second, the bill does increase the allowance amount from $200,000 in the previous bill language to $500,000 here. However, as described earlier, this allowance decreases over time, but it is not entirely eliminated should a former president be eligible for the allowance. We thought the office of the former president is an important institution to support in a nominal way. We were all recently reminded of the importance of this institution by the joint effort of former presidents to raise hurricane relief funds. Third, the pension and allowance are terminated 30 days after the death of a former president instead of immediately upon death. This change was made to accommodate the work that must be done to wrap up the affairs of a former president. Finally, I want to assure my colleagues that this bill does not impact funding for security or protection of a former president. I want to thank Senator Ernst for her work on this bill in previous years and this particular bill in 2017. It has been a pleasure to work with her and her staff. I also want to acknowledge members like Mr. Cummings and Mr. Grothman and former Chairman Chaffetz, whose work on this bill last year positioned us to be successful this year. 
I also want to express my gratitude to the professional staff on this committee who have put so many hours of work on this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support it. The chairman from Georgia yields back. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. First of all, let me uh, thank you, Mr. Heiss, for all the work you put into this. Um, and I think the changes that have been made reflects the bill. Um, this legislation would amend the former President's Act of 1958 to cap a former President's annual pension at $200,000 indexed to inflation. The bill also would provide an additional annual allowance for expenses that would start at $500,000 per year and decrease to $250,000. Under this bill, the annual allowance would be reduced dollar for dollar. In instances in which a former President's adjusted gross income in a taxable year exceeds $400,000. This legislation would not affect any funding for the security and protection of former Presidents and their spouses. The legislation would update the pension amount for surviving spouses of former Presidents, which has been unchanged since 1958, by increasing it from $20,000 to $100,000. Last Congress, President Obama vetoed a previous version of this legislation because it would have had unintended consequences. For example, due to technical drafting errors, it would have resulted in the immediate termination of the salary and benefits of certain staff of the former Presidents. It also would have resulted in termination of leases for office space and removal of furniture and equipment. That was clearly not an acceptable situation, and I am glad that we have had the, been able to resolve most of these problems in the legislation before us today. However, an additional technical uh, change may be needed uh, to this bill to ensure that individuals who perform public duties are properly compensated. I believe this bill makes fiscal sense. I look forward to working with Representative Heiss to further perfect it. And again, uh, I urge the support of this bill. It is a good piece of legislation. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? The gentlelady from the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your putting this bill back on the calendar. I appreciate uh, our ranking member for his remarks. I, this is a bill that we passed the last time. It is really an update. It is an out-of-date manner this former President's Act uh, to reflect the uh, mercifully changed status of the District of Columbia. <laughs> used to be a part of the Federal Government. Can you, can you imagine that? We are paying taxes then, too. Uh, and therefore, as long as this uh, outdated bill is, is, is on the books, it, it's, it reflects the law in 1950. Eight, at the time of this bill, there were no elected officials in the District of Columbia, and so all the district's funds, its local funds, were, were deposited in the, in the Treasury. Uh, and the Federal Government paid uh, the contributions to the pensions of uh, D.C. Government employees. So we want to make the former President's Act is intended to make sure that there is no double dipping from the U.S. Treasury by collecting a Federal pension uh, during any period that uh, an employee was employed by the Federal Government or the D.C. Government. Uh, now, it became outdated with respect to the D.C. Government when the, when the Congress uh, granted D.C. Uh, home rule. Uh, the Home Rule Act uh, uh, of course, uh, means that local taxes and fees are no longer deposited with the Federal Treasury, but in D.C. government accounts. This is kind of embarrassment to have this bill still on the books about double dipping when that is no longer possible. That is why I am so grateful it was passed before I asked that it be passed again. I think this is the kind of bill that the next time our time to go on suspension should be placed uh, on suspension because it is uh, just that trivial. But I do appreciate very much, Mr. Chairman, you are once again putting it on the calendar, and I ask uh, for the adoption of this bill. General Lady yields back. Do any other members wish to be heard? 
question now is on favorably reporting H.R. 3739 in the House of Representatives. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. The opinion of the chair of the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Next item of consideration is H.R. 3071, the Federal Acquisition Savings Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3071 to require executive agencies to consider equipment rental in any cost effectiveness analysis for equipment acquisition and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, co sponsor of the bill, Mr. Heiss, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's an honor to speak on behalf of my colleague from Georgia, Buddy Carter, uh, on this bill. The Gov Government Accountability Office reported that agencies annually spend more than $200 billion on average purchasing or leasing equipment, with purchasing accounting for almost all of this spending. Given current physical constraints, the Federal Acquisition Savings Act of 2017 provides a common sense opportunity to save money when acquiring equipment. Current rules encourage agencies to consider the cost and most effective way to obtain equipment by considering only purchasing versus leasing. Surprisingly, the current rules do not include the option to rent the equipment. This bill encourages agencies to consider renting equipment as a cost savings measure versus purchasing or leasing such equipment. The bill also directs the Federal Acquisitions Council to revise current acquisition rules to implement this policy. Renting equipment can provide a more cost-effective and flexible alternative to buying or even leasing. When purchasing equipment, the purchaser makes a long-term investment and assumes the total cost of ownership for that equipment. In some cases, this may be appropriate. However, there are short-term needs that can be met without assuming the cost of purchasing and maintaining equipment. In these cases, leasing is sometimes considered, but depending on an agency's needs, leasing may not be the best low-cost option relative to renting. Typically, there are defined leasing periods and leases are specific to a piece of equipment. In addition, capital could be tied up in lease financing and the cost of maintenance, insurance, and storage or the responsibility of the leasee, not the leasor. Alternatively, equipment rental for a temporary period with no fixed duration may fit the need and provide a more cost-effective, flexible option. Renting is a particular cost-effective option where there are low equipment utilization rates. One of the key cost savings benefits of renting equipment is that rental agreements typically cover the cost of ownership including storage, maintenance, insurance, transport, and licensing. This bill seeks to encourage agencies to consider equipment renting option where appropriate. State and local governments have used the equipment rental option with great success, but the federal government has not widely adopted this low-cost option. For example, the Texas Department of Transportation has reported savings of $10.6 million due to the rental program. They reported renting more than 1,200 pieces of equipment at a cost of $18.9 million and purchasing 931 assets costing more than $40 million. The Mississippi Department of Transportation commissioned a study on their equipment management processes and systems and found that renting equipment such as bulldozers and motor graders to supplement their fleet was the most cost-effective option. In fact, the study found Mississippi could realize over $13,000 in annual cost savings and $180,000 in life cycle cost savings per bulldozer unit. This bill presents a golden opportunity to realize cost savings, obtaining equipment by directing agencies to consider the rental option. So I want to thank Representative Buddy Carter for his leadership on this bill. I also want to thank other co-sponsors of this bill, especially those members of this committee, Representative Meadows, Ross, and Grothman, and I urge my colleagues to support this common sense bill. The gentleman from Georgia yields back. The Chair will now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 3071, the Federal Acquisition Savings Act would require Federal contracting officers to consider short-term lease-term rentals. Uh, in addition to a long-term leasing or purchasing when acquiring equipment uh, agencies need. The Federal Acquisitions Regulation is currently unclear 
about whether short-term rentals are permitted. Bill, this bill would provide an additional flexibility by allowing such rentals and by requiring renting to be considered as an option. I support giving contracting officers additional tools to make the most cost-effective and efficient decisions. The bill also would require GAO to produce a report on the use of renting or leasing by Federal agencies. The requirements for that report seem very burdensome for GAO. And I would ask that before the bill moves to the floor, we examine the issue further. I know we all value GAO's work and want to make the best use of its resources. Uh, I will be voting in favor of this bill and uh, perhaps that we can make uh, just some affecting improvements. With that, I yield back. The gentleman from uh, Maryland yields back. And as I am about to ask if any other members want to be heard, I see that Mr. Connolly would be one of those. The gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, echo the sentiments of Mr. Heiss and Mr. Cummings. And I'm happy to co-sponsor H.R. 3071, offered by our friend and colleague, Mr. Buddy Carter from Georgia. Currently, when agencies are seeking to acquire equipment, they are required to evaluate whether leasing or owning would be more cost effective. Our bill would simply require agencies to factor in the cost of rentals when conducting this analysis. Equipment rentals may be more cost effective for agencies, especially in instances where the duration of the rental is relatively short or when certain equipment is not readily available at a specific location. One example where rentals may not only be more cost effective but necessary is in the preparation for an aftermath of a natural disaster, such as FEMA and other Federal agencies' responses to Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. To prepare to respond to the hurricanes, FEMA needed to position equipment at certain locations so it could be, uh, they could be quickly deployed at the right moment. It may not make sense for FEMA to own or lease long-term equipment such as forklifts, excavators, or dump trucks that are intermittently used for a short yet critical period of time. During this time, renting may not only be more cost effective, but would actually help FEMA increase its capacity to respond. So I think this is a good government bill. I'm pleased to go sponsor it, and I urge its adoption. I yield back. Chairman from Virginia yields back. Do any other members wish to be heard? The question is now will favorably reporting H.R. 3071 in the House of Representatives. Those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed by saying no. The opinion of the chair of the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Next item for consideration is H.R. 1701, the Eliminating Government Funded Oil Painting Act. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 1701 to prohibit the use of Federal funds for the costs of painting portraits of officers and employees of the Federal Government. I ask unanimous consent the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. It is my understanding our friend from Pennsylvania and the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Cartwright, will offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute to the bill. The gentleman is recognized to call up his amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Gowdy. Uh, uh, we have a, uh, an amendment to cure uh, and make uh, technical corrections to the bill's codification. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1701 offered by Mr. Cartwright of Pennsylvania. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes for a statement on the bill and his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Gowdy, uh, Ranking Member Cummings, uh, welcome back. I want to thank you for holding this markup and including H.R. 1701, the Eliminating Government Funded Oil Painting Act, or the EGO, the EGO Act. Uh, this bill is a bipartisan measure that would prohibit Federal funds from being used to pay for portraits of officers and employees of Federal Government, uh, including the President, the Vice President, members of Congress, and the heads of Federal agencies. Uh, the amendment in the nature of a substitute uh, simply makes technical corrections to the bill's codification. Congress owes a duty to taxpayers to spend Federal funds in a way that is both effective and efficient, uh, while the costs associated with portraits obviously represent only a tiny portion of the Federal budget. 
Every single dollar the government spends on these vanity projects is a dollar not spent forwarding the welfare of ordinary Americans. Uh, this bill is emblematic of a greater goal, obviously. Congress needs to prioritize saving taxpayer dollars. Uh, the official portraits for the President, the First Lady, and certain members of Congress, uh, like committee chairs, Mr. Chairman, uh, currently are paid for by private funds. Uh, by prohibiting federal spending on official portraits, uh, this bill would prompt Congress uh, and federal agencies to embrace the same fiscally responsible approach of res relying on private donations. Uh, importantly, the bill would send a message to the American taxpayer that we will only spend their money on matters of national interest. I want to close by thanking our Senate sponsors of the EGO Act, Senators Ron Johnson, Bill Cassidy, and Claire McCaskill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding, uh, and I do urge the committee to support this bill and its important message. The gentleman from Pennsylvania yields back. Uh, the chair will now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Russell, for a statement on the bill and the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank my friend from Pennsylvania uh, for his work uh, in this effort. In the past, federal agencies were spending anywhere from twenty to fifty thousand dollars each on portraits of government workers. Collectively, uh, the federal government was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars each year on paintings. Uh, it, in the grand scheme of things, it may not seem like much, but we didn't get to twenty trillion dollars of debt uh, in one fell swoop. We got it through twenty and fifty thousand dollar non-essential spending attitudes over the years. In 2014, Congress did include a provision in appropriations bills to ban uh, agencies from using these taxpayer dollars, and what this will do in the nature of the substitute that's been submitted is make the ban permanent. If government officials need portraits of themselves, they can pay for it themselves. Taxpayers should not foot the bill. This is a good bipartisan piece of legislation. I'm honored uh, to include my name with it. And I ask that Republicans and Democrats alike agree that taxpayer dollars should not be used for this purpose. And I urge my colleagues to support the amendment in the nature of a substitute and the underlying legislation. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Oklahoma yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania for working on this. I guess my question is this, is, is there anything that would preclude uh, substantial contributions being made if the chairman wanted a portrait of himself uh, put up on the wall. Uh, I wanted just to, to verify and clarify that. Will the, will the member yield so, so I can answer the question? Uh, sure. Uh, this bill ha uh, has no application to the currently planned equestrian statue of <laughs> Chairman Gowdy. I can give well, with that, then I back. fully support uh, the, the gentleman's uh, legislation. I'll yield back. I can give both of you a long list of things to worry about. Me having a portrait or statue would not be among those things. So rest assured that won't happen. Does anybody else wish to be heard? The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I want to associate myself with the words of Mr. Cartwright and Mr. Russell. Um, I think this is a, a good bill. And I urge our members to support it. Gentleman from Maryland yields back. Any other member wish to be heard? The question is now on the amendment of the nature of the substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on favorably reporting H.R. 1701 as amended. To the House of Representatives, those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported as amendment. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The next item for consideration is H.R. 3019, the Promoting Value-Based Procurement Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3019, to require executive agencies to avoid using lowest price tech technically acceptable source selection criteria in certain circumstances and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so order, I now recognize the chairman of the Subcommittee on Government Affairs and sponsor of the bill, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for your willingness to uh, mark up this particular piece of legislation. I'll be very brief. Uh, this is a common sense uh, bill that actually uh, has bipartisan support. I want to thank uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Representative uh, Jerry Conley, who uh, I understand will be offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute, which I fully and totally support. Uh, and in doing that, uh, the other co-sponsors, obviously, uh, Don Byers from Virginia and Rob Whitman from Virginia. This really uh, gets down to, to a basic uh, procurement act where we, we obviously need to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money. It is their money, not ours. And yet, at the same time, uh, there are times when we... Uh, uh, use uh, the, the lowest uh, acceptable, uh, technically proficient uh, procurement uh, vehicle in a way that actually does not promote value. So uh, this uh, helps establish some guidelines and framework for us to be more efficient with the taxpayer funds. I certainly uh, encourage my colleagues to support it. With that, I yield back. The general with North Carolina yields back. We now recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Government Operations and a co-sponsor of the bill, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Meadows for his leadership um, uh, on this issue. Uh, I think both Mr. Meadows and I, uh, in our leadership role in the Government Operations Subcommittee, recognize that uh, the lowest uh, cost bid often is, in fact, the best. And we ought to always be seeking opportunities to press down the cost of services and goods. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you've got to look at value as well. And the rigid application of cost only, I think, has started to calcify some large chunks of contracting in the federal sphere. I, I think I share with you, Mr. Chairman, a story told by one of my former bosses, John Glenn. Uh, when he was often asked, what, what did you feel when you were in that capsule about to be you know, taken uh, into orbit as the first man to circumnavigate the, the Earth? And his answer was, all I could think of was I was sitting in this little, little space on top of 90,000 pounds of thrust provided by the lowest cost bidder. And uh, it kind of makes the point. So, the bill that Mr. Meadows and I are offering on behalf of ourselves and uh, Mr. Byer of Virginia, Mr. Whitman of Virginia, uh, would try to redress that. And as, uh, as Mr. Meadows indicated at the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I do have an amendment that would somewhat clarify and circumscribe this uh, to try to allay some concerns that have been brought to our attention, especially by some Federal employee groups. The gentleman from Virginia yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? For what purpose does the gentleman, uh, well, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings? I'll be very, I'll be, thank you very much for yielding, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Um, I want to thank Chairman uh, Meadows and Ranking Member Connolly for uh, their thoughtful uh, remarks and their hard work on this bill. Mr. Chairman, I have serious concerns about this bill uh, as introduced. However, I understand that Mr. Connolly will be offering a substitute amendment. Uh, so I will withhold my remarks until that time. I yield back. Chairman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3019 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain the amendment. I thank the chair. As noted uh, earlier, uh, I am in favor of factoring quality and value into procurements. However, there have been concerns, as the ranking member just indicated, that the bill may unintentionally discourage the use of lowest uh, price source selection methods, even when it may be the best option for the Federal Government. That is not our intention. I would like to thank the ranking member and his staff and the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Meadows, for working with us on an amendment to try to address and allay those concerns while still maintaining the intent of the original bill. The bill as introduced would place certain requirements on contracting officers any time they choose to deploy LBTA uh, source selection methods. Uh, this substitute amendment would limit the, that requirement that agencies document and justify the use of LPTA source selection methods to procurements that are predominantly for the acquisition of knowledge-based services and training, logistics services, and personnel protective equipment. That 
will narrow the focus of the bill to the types of procurements that lend themselves to a best value approach while leaving the rest of it untouched. This uh, welcome compromise, I, I hope it's welcome, well, is trying to get the best value in a procurement while also ensuring that LPTA is not discouraged when appropriate. When an agency seeks the assistance of a company to help it analyze and address cybersecurity needs, for example, it may not know the full extent of services that will eventually be needed. In such instances, quality and innovation must be considered in the evaluation of a contract proposal rather than the price only. When the Federal Government is buying pencils, however, price should probably be our overriding concern, and this substitute amendment takes cognizance of that. Finally, the substitute amendment amends the requirement that GAO submit to Congress a report on the number of instances where the LPTA source selection criteria is used. The original bill required that GAO look at those contracts exceeding $2 million. This amendment increases that threshold to $5 million, which will more narrowly tailor GAO's detailed evaluation of LPTA contracts. The amendment also represents a bipartisan compromise that allows Congress to better evaluate how the consideration of value-based contracts has an impact on the Federal Government's ability to acquire the services it needs. I have uh, we've cleared this amendment, Mr. Chairman, uh, with all four uh, original uh, authors of the bill, the underlying bill, Mr. Meadows, uh, Mr. Byer, Mr. Whitman, and myself. We've also uh, cleared it with the ranking minority members, staff, and with your staff, and I hope for its adoption. I yield back. The gentleman from Virginia yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman from Virginia for his leadership and, and the amendment and the nature of a substitute, and certainly for the clarifying language that gets at the, the intent of what uh, really good governance is all about. I thank the ranking member, uh, Mr. Cummings, the gentleman from Maryland, uh, for his input as well. And I welcome him back. Uh, it uh, truly uh, is, uh, I can honestly say I've been praying for him and his recovery for many, many uh, days, and it's good to have him back. And, and with that, I fully urge my colleagues to support the amendment in the nature of substitute. I yield back. The gentleman from North Carolina yields back. The question is now on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Are those in favor signify by saying aye? Aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on favorably reporting H.R. 3019 as amendment to the House of Representatives. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed by signify by saying no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the bill is ordered favorably reported as amended. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The next item for consideration is H.R. 3737, the Social Media Use and Clearance Investigations Act of 2017. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3737, to provide for a study of the use of social media in security clearance investigations. I ask unanimous consent the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. For that objection so ordered, I now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on National Security and the sponsor of the bill, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis, for five minutes for a statement on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, millions of Americans will use a simple Google search to find social media information on a prospective hire for a company or somebody they're going on a date with, but our federal government still does not check publicly available social media for all security clearance applicants. And the social media has emerged as one of the best ways to understand an individual's interests and activities, but security clearance investigations still focus far more attention on things like interviewing neighbors. On May 12, 2016, the day before an OGR hearing on the subject, the Office of Director of National Intelligence issued a new policy permitting the use of publicly available social media information in security clearance investigations. Despite that legal clearance, though, most security clearance investigations still do not involve a social media check. Various federal entities have studied the potential for social media information and background investigations for at least a decade. NSA, the Army, OPM, and others have conducted pilot programs on the effectiveness of social media checks. It is not clear what use has been made of the data from these programs or whether the programs can be expanded to cover more applicants. This bill is a first step toward implementing a simple check of publicly available social media for the individuals we trust with our nation's most sensitive information. The bill requires the Office of Management and Budget to evaluate the pilot programs conducted to date and estimate the cost of wider implementation of publicly available social media checks. 
OMB's report will help guide subsequent legislation to require checks of publicly available social media for security clearance candidates. Um, I urge my colleagues to support the bill, and I thank the ranking member of our subcommittee, Mr. Lynch, for his co-sponsorship of this bill. And I yield back. The gentleman from Florida yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Mr. Chairman, uh, I support the Social Media Use and Clearance Investigations Act, a bipartisan bill that was introduced by uh, Congressman DeSantis and uh, Lynch. This bill would require the Director of the Office of Management and Budget to issue a report to Congress on the use of social media checks and background investigations for security clearances. Over the past six years, different agencies have begun uh, pilot programs to help develop the best methods for incorporating social media into background checks. For example, the Army initiated uh, a pilot program that found that while uh, checking social media is a valuable tool, it can be costly and raise uh, legal issues. Uh, this bill would require that OMB conduct a comprehensive uh, study on these issues and report back to the Congress. I believe this report would greatly assist Congress in determining whether further legislative action is needed when it comes to the Federal Government's use of social media and background investigations. And with that, I urge uh, the adoption of this uh, bill. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? The question is now on favor favorably reporting H.R. 3737 in the House of Representatives. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. The opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Next item for consideration is H.R. 2331, the Connected Government Act. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2331 to require a new or updated Federal website that is intended for use by the public to be mobile friendly and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent the bill be considered uh, as read and open for amendment at any point. Without objection, so ordered. It is my understanding the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Information Technology and the sponsor of the bill, Ms. Kelly, will offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute to the bill. The gentlewoman is recognized to call up her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, too, want to welcome back Ranking Member Cummings. I also want to thank my wonderful friend, Mr. Meadows, Chairman of the Government Operations Subcommittee, for co-sponsoring this bill, the Connected Government Act. My bill takes a simple but important step to make sure that all Americans can stay in touch with their government. My bill simply requires that any new or updated Federal website must be mobile friendly, something that is nearly universal in the 2017 business environment. For millions of Americans without access to reliable broadband or without a desktop computer, smartphones have become their doorway to the Internet. A recent Pew report found that if you are a younger American, lower income American, rural American, or a minority, you are more likely to rely on smartphones. But according to a report by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, more than 40 percent of government websites are incompatible with smartphones, including FOSFA and the entry point to bid on government contracts. It is 2017. We just celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the iPhone. It is simply unacceptable that any Federal website cannot be viewed or easily navigated on a smartphone. Americans deserve a modern government that is accessible and responsible to their needs. Recently, Hurricanes Harvey and Irma showed that smartphones were vital lifelines to rescue. In areas without power, people are still depending on their smartphones to remain connected. Imagine the frustration of navigating the SBA, FEMA, or HUD websites on a five-inch screen surging for immediate assistance in the aftermath of these storms. My bill makes it easier for Americans to connect with their government. My amendment in the nature of a substitute makes a technical change to the reporting requirements under the bill. It would have OMB and GSA report to Congress on the implementation of this Act and would make the report available publicly. This amendment ensures that our committee and all members are up to date on this simple effort to make government work. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and excuse my voice. I have a cold. I yield back. General Lady yields back. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2331 offered by Ms. Kelly of Illinois. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the uh, eloquent words just used by Ms. Kelly will be reflected uh, in connection also with the amendment in the nature of a substitute. And the gentleman from North Carolina is now recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to thank the uh, gentlewoman from Illinois uh, for her leadership on this particular issue. And she's, she's exactly right. We can find all kinds of things on the Internet, and uh, certainly the OMB and uh, our good friend Director Mulvaney would uh, certainly support the codification of, of this and making sure that it's mo mobile friendly. But when I can take my iPhone out and get a picture of the sponsor of this particular legislation very easily, uh, shouldn't we be able to do the same thing on every single government website? Uh, this is a common sense bill that we should support. I wholeheartedly uh, uh, thank the, the uh, gentlewoman from Illinois for her leadership and urge my colleagues to support uh, the amendment in the nature of a substitute and underlying bill. The gentleman from North Carolina yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland. First of all, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, say that uh, I also I, I want to express my appreciation for all that we are doing today in a bipartisan way. Um, Mr. Meadows told me a while back um, that he is going to do everything in his power to show America that uh, we can agree on things and get things done. And I think we have seen a series of bills today, uh, and this one included, where it is true bipartisanship. We may disagree on a lot. But the things that we can agree on, I think it is very important that the American people see us and feel us doing their business. And so I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for you know, what you have done. I remember one of the things that you said is that you wanted agreement on the Secret Service Bill, for example. Well, we were not going to bring it up. We are going to get agreement. And I thank you. But that being said, uh, for many people, their cell phones are their connection to the world. According to the Pew Research Center, 95 percent of Americans own a cell phone of some kind with an increasing number of people relying on smartphones. This is especially true for younger, rural or lower income Americans who use their smartphones to browse the Internet. This bill would acknowledge that reality and seek to ensure that all Federal agency websites are mobile friendly. Making Federal websites mobile friendly would make the government more transparent and accessible to a larger proportion of the American public. The Connected Government Act introduced by uh, my colleague, Representative Kelly, is a simple step towards making government work for everyone. I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I want to thank you. And to Mr. Meadows, I want to thank you for your prayers. As my mother, who is 91 years old, and a Pentecostal minister would say, said, boy, the Lord has been working overtime for you. And so, Thank you very much. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard? The question is now on the amendment of the nation to substitute. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The question is now on favorably to reporting H.R. 2331 as, amend as amended to the House of Representatives. Those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. The opinion of the Chair of the Ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported as amended. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The committee will now consider postal naming bills. Um, and again, uh, I want to thank Mr. Cummings and his folks for working with uh, Mr. Meadows and everyone on our staff for being able to uh, get us to a point where we can consider postal bills um, again. Uh, H.R. 294, H.R. 452, H.R. 606, H.R. 1207, H.R. 1208, H.R. 1209, H.R. 1210, H.R. 1211, H.R. 1858, H.R. 1950, H.R. 2254, H.R. 2302, H.R. 2464, H.R. 2815, H.R. 2873, H.R. 3109, H.R. 3230, and H.R. 3369 can be considered in block. I ask unanimous consent these bills be ordered favorably reported to the House of Representatives. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, before we conclude, I want to uh, thank all the members for coming today. I, I am keenly aware of the uh, conflicts that exist in a uh, member of Congress's schedule, and there are lots of things competing for your time, all of which are very important. Every one of you serves on more than one committee, and I, I realize time is precious. And for those of you who 
came. And for those who, frankly, wanted very much to come but had something else competing, uh, I just want to tell you on a personal level uh, how grateful I am to you. I ask unanimous consent staff be allowed to make necessary technical and conforming changes to the bills ordered reported today, subject to the approval of the minority. That objection so ordered. If there is no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned.